Last week, we began a series in the book of Philippians. We tried to get a 30,000-foot view of the entire book in order to familiarize ourselves with the, the historical context and the major themes of that book. We mentioned that above all, Philippians is about the gospel, even though it's become a little trite to refer to gospel this and gospel that, Philippians truly is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul uses that word euangelion more frequently in the book of Philippians than he does in any of his other letters. And as we also mentioned, the, the theme verse, chapter 1, verse 27, calls Christians to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. He wants the Philippians to be a gospel-driven people, to have gospel-driven lives. We also mentioned that much of the letter simply overflows with a sincere love and affection, deep affection that is shared between Paul and the Philippians, their fellow partakers in the grace of God in that gospel, and at the same time their fellow laborers and strugglers in the cause of the gospel as, as they minister to the gospel along with Paul side by side. And so he writes to them to express his thankfulness and joy for their partnership in the gospel. Like we said, it's not that that letter is without instruction or command or warning and exhortation. He loves them. They have proven themselves to be in the grace of God, to be believers, partakers in the grace of God. And yet Paul still instructs them, still calls them to excel still more, to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. He called them to be striving together and standing firm for the faith of the gospel amidst opposition, to strive for unity together within the congregation, to, to humbly regard one another as more important than themselves, and then also, of course, to rejoice in the Lord always. And I express to you that I, I believe that Paul's message to the Philippians is very timely and very relevant for us here in Grace Life as fellow partakers of the grace of God in Jesus Christ and as fellow laborers in the ministry of His gospel, I want us all to experience and to express the love and affection for one another that Paul and the Philippians experienced on those same grounds of being sharers in the gospel and partakers, fellow laborers in its ministry. I want us all to be stirred up by that love and affection, and also to be stirred up to excel still more by the Word of God through the Apostle Paul to the Philippians to conduct every aspect of our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so, having conducted our overview last week, this morning we come to the opening two verses of the letter, Paul's greeting. Now, any good preacher will tell you that the point of Bible study and sermon preparation is to find the main point of the passage and then to make that main point of the passage be reflected in an easy and helpful way as the main point of the sermon. And sometimes doing a faithful job in discovering that main point and representing it in a helpful way, it's not all that easy. There are language barriers, there are cultural barriers, there are historical barriers that need to be overcome by the diligence of faithful study. But in these opening verses, Paul's main point is not very difficult to arrive at. It's not obscure. It's not complicated. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul's main point is to say hello. It is to give his greeting, to bring to the Philippians his warm, loving, and affectionate greetings. But Paul's greeting is so much more significant than just saying hello. He actually packs some serious theology into these short opening verses. Right at the outset, Paul condenses into one short sentence the essence of the Christian life and the essence of the Christian message, abbreviated to be sure, but there nonetheless. And because every word of God is inspired, infallible, inerrant, and profitable, the richness and the benefit of the Word of God only grows exponentially greater as we dig deeper and deeper into its treasures. And so we're going to spend some time this morning digging into the, to Paul's greeting of grace and peace. And by God's grace, we'll be blessed, I pray, by the depth and the profundity of God's Word. Let's read the opening two verses together. God's Word reads, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, 
to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to examine three components of Paul's opening greeting to the Philippians. We're going to look at the slaves, at the saints, and at the salutation. But because Paul can't even begin his letter without getting past, because he can't even get past the greeting without repeating the name of Christ three times in these two short verses, I want our outline to reflect that extraordinarily Christ-saturated focus of the Apostle Paul. So this morning, our outline will be this way. We'll say, first, we'll look at the slaves of Christ. Second, we'll look at the saints in Christ. And third, we'll look at the salutation because of Christ. The slaves of Christ, the saints in Christ, and the salutation because of Christ. So let's look first then at the slaves of Christ. Verse 1 again. Paul and Timothy bond servants, but better rendered slaves of Christ Jesus. See, Paul begins his letter by identifying himself as the author, as any letter writer would in the ancient world. And the Philippians know Paul. As we saw in our overview last week, the Philippians were intimately equated with Paul and his ministry of the gospel, laboring and striving and struggling with him, sharing with him in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. It says in verse 5, they were consistently giving of their own financial resources, and they were consistently giving of their own spiritual resources. And we see that in this letter in the, manifested in the person of Epaphroditus. They sent Epaphroditus to minister to Paul's needs. And so they know Paul. But for our own sake, let's remind ourselves briefly of the biography of the Apostle Paul. We learn quite a bit about Paul from considering his own autobiography later on in the letter of uh, the Philippians. In chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, he gives us his fleshly credentials. Chapter 3, verse 5, he says, "'Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless.'" So Paul was orthodox. He was circumcised on the eighth day according to the, the standard given in the Mosaic law for all infant Jewish males. He was of the nation of Israel. He was of the chosen people of God. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, one of only two tribes of Israel to make up the southern kingdom, the other one being Judah, and thus one of the only two tribes to survive past the Assyrian captivity. He was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning that he stood out amongst the crowd. He was raised in Jerusalem, the city, the capital city itself, and he was educated under the rabbi Gamaliel, who we learn from Acts 5.34 was a Pharisee and a teacher of the law, respected by all the people. And in Acts 22.3, Paul says that he was educated under Gamaliel strictly according to the law of his fathers. Being educated by a Pharisee, Paul himself was also a Pharisee. He belonged to that party of the Jews that was most zealous for the Old Testament Scriptures. And as to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. As it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. And back in Acts 22, verse 4, as he stands before the Jews in Jerusalem, he says, I persecuted this way, meaning the Christians, the Christianity is called the way. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. And as he was continuing to breathe out murderous threats against the Christians, Acts 9 says, as he was traveling to Damascus to drag into custody more Christians there and bring them to Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus showed up in a blazing light from heaven, knocked him to the ground, and struck him blind. And at that moment, the Hebrew of Hebrews world was turned upside down. Everything changed for Paul in that moment. Which is why he says in the next verse in Philippians 3, verse 7, after outlining his fleshly credentials in 5 and 6, he says, But whatever things were gained to me, 
Those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That's Paul, that zealous, legalistic super Jew who had his world turned upside down by the risen Christ. After that, everything of fleshly value was lost on him. He gladly gave it all up to pursue a righteousness which was outside of himself, a righteousness which, a righteousness which was an alien righteousness, Christ's righteousness, reckoned to be his through faith alone. And since that very hour on the Damascus Road, he has dedicated his life to literally traveling the known world, proclaiming that gospel, proclaiming that righteousness through faith alone in this crucified and resurrected Messiah. And the Philippians themselves have been beneficiaries and participants in that ministry. But Paul doesn't only include his name at the opening of this letter. He also includes his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy. We turn to Acts chapter 16 for Timothy's biography. There we learn that he was, he was uh, living in Lystra and was born to a Gentile father and a Jewish mother named Eunice who raised him in the nurture and admonition of the God of Israel. According to Acts chapter 16 verse 2, Timothy had earned quite a good re reputation around Lystra and Iconium among the believers, showing himself to be an example of the faith. He was so well spoken of and apparently, Paul was so impressed with his devotion that Paul asked him to join him on the second missionary journey. Now, not only did young Timothy agree to leave the comfort of everything that he was familiar with, but he also agreed to be circumcised as an adult. As an adult, both he and Paul knew that Timothy's Gentile father would be a stumbling block among the Jews that he would be going and ministering the gospel to. And even though both of them knew, as it says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, that circumcision was nothing, Timothy was so devoted to putting no stumbling block in the way of the gospel that he agreed to have this quite painful and theologically unnecessary procedure done to him. And on top of this devotion, Timothy was with Paul when the Philippian church began. He was circumcised in verse 3, and by verse 12, they're in Philippi, and in verse 14, Lydia is converted. And so he's there with them from the beginning, but not just from the beginning. He also returned to minister to them at least two other times. Acts 19.22 says that Paul sent Timothy and Erastus into Macedonia, which is where Philippi was, while Paul stayed in Asia. And that would have been about five years later, about A.D. 54, Five years later, after that first visit in around A.D. 49. And aside from that second visit, Acts 20, verse 3, tells us that Timothy came to Philippi a third time just a year after that, which would have made it around A.D. 55 on the third missionary journey. So the Philippians are familiar with Timothy, and that's why Paul can commend him to them as an example of humility and service. And say in Philippians chapter 2, verse 22, you know, Philippians, of Timothy's proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. That's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. And so it makes sense that Paul would want to send him to the Philippians soon so that he could minister to them in, in a way that he had in the past and also in the way that he'd been ministering to Paul recently so effectively and so encouragingly. In fact, almost everything you need to know to get a good snapshot, a good capture of Timothy is what Paul says about him in Philippians 2, 19 to 21. Paul says, "'But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly.'" so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. 
For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. No one else of kindred spirit. The Greek word is the same soul. This is the affection and, and the, the connection that Paul had with Timothy. No one else's heart beats with my heart like Timothy's. There, no one else has a true and genuine and loving concern for you, Philippians, like this man who you know, who you grew up with you and who was there when we founded this church. In Paul's imprisonment, the shame and the prospect of persecution had led all of his companions to desert him. They all seek after their own interests, he says. But so great was Timothy's love for Paul that he didn't mind coming to Rome, identifying himself to the, the ruler of the entire known world as a friend of this subversive preacher. Though everyone else had deserted him, Timothy was willing to be outcast if it meant he could stay with Paul and minister to his needs. That's Timothy. And we've heard enough just this morning about these extraordinary men to know that their lives had typified the designation that Paul chooses to describe the both of them in verse 1. The New American Standard, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, has Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus. But the Greek word there is douloi, douloi from the word doulos, which our pastor has labored so faithfully to try to show us means slave, unquestionably. It means slave. So Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. And this is a favorite designation of the apostles and the other writers of Scripture. James claims this title for himself in the opening verse of his epistle. Peter does as well in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. The apostle John does in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, as well as Jude in his letter. Now, on top of James and Peter and Jude and John, Paul repeats this designation in seven of his letters throughout of his, other, his other letters. Ephesians, Colossians, he's a slave of Christ, a doulos of Christ. In fact, even the slave girl in Philippi who was possessed by a spirit of divination when they were ministering in Philippi that, at that first moment, right after Lydia gets converted, it's the slave girl who's following Paul and Timothy and Luke around saying, these are the slaves of the Most High God. They proclaim to you salvation in His name. So even she knew. The term slave is used at least 40 times in the New Testament to refer to the believer. And the Hebrew equivalent in the Old Testament is used at least 250 times to refer to the believers in Yahweh. I think it's safe to say that the Lord wants His people to understand themselves in this way. At its core, the essence of the Christian life can be described as slavery to Christ. So what does it mean to be a slave? In our pastor's excellent book, he, he outlines five parallels between biblical Christianity and first century slavery. And I want to go through them quickly because I really do feel that they capture the heart of this metaphor, this metaphor that was so important to the apostles and Scripture writers. First, a slave was exclusively owned, exclusive ownership, exclusive ownership. As Paul says to the believers so clearly in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So Christians don't exist in some world of untethered autonomy. We're not the captains of our own ship. We were bought with a price. Somebody paid, you have a price on your head. And it was paid, it was given. And so we belong to the one who has paid that price. And therefore, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, he says, therefore, because you were bought with a price and you are not your own, glorify God in your body. Exclusive ownership implies, number two, complete submission. Complete submission. If we belong to Christ, if He owns us, the rule of our lives is not our own will, but His will, our Master's will. So exclusive ownership, complete submission. Third, there is singular devotion. Singular devotion. No slave concerned himself with, being, with obeying other masters. His chief concern was carrying out the will of the one who owned him. Our master, the Lord Jesus himself, reminds us in Matthew 6, 24, that no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. 
George Mueller, the 19th century evangelist, widely known for his oversight of orphanages in England and also for his commitment and devotion to prayer, he said this. He, he captures the spirit of slavery to Christ beautifully. He says, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller and his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will, died to the world, its approval or censure, died to the approval or blame even of even my brethren and friends, and since then I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. The slave of Christ is singularly devoted. Fourth, the slave is also marked by a total dependence. He was completely dependent on his master for the provision of the basic necessities of life. And in the same way, the Christian must humbly depend entirely upon the beneficence of another, the beneficence of our master, and not at all on ourselves. And because he's a kind and loving master, our needs are met and we are free to serve our master uninhibited and with all eagerness and joy. Total dependence is good news for slaves who, who cannot accomplish anything of themselves and for slaves whose master is loving and kind. And finally, the slave was personally accountable to his master. Personally accountable. In the same way the slave was personally accountable, Christ is the one alone to whom we will answer the one to whom we will give an account. So Christians, most fundamentally, are slaves of Christ Jesus. And as we've gone through those five characteristics, I hope that you recognize that slavery to Christ is not a drudgery. This is not a tyrannical, despotic relationship fueled by abject fear and forced submission. The picture is not of someone whose will is constantly frustrated over and against the whims of his master. Rather, it's the picture of someone whose will is, over time and after repeated exposure to that master, is lovingly and happily conformed to the master's will. Alexander McLaren called it the blending and absorption of my own will in his will. So it's not just I do what he wants and not what I want. It's that as he teaches me and as he shows me more of himself, what I want becomes what he wants. And so slavery becomes a delightful service. Nor was the slave status always automatically dishonorable. It was a, a great privilege to be called the doulos of Caesar, a slave of Caesar, because the status of your master was transferred or you were associated at least with the status of your master as a slave. And in the, in the same way for Christians, being slaves of Christ was, as Pastor John says, quote, not only an affirmation of their complete submission to the master, it was also a declaration of the privileged position every Christian enjoys by being associated with the Lord. No affiliation could be greater than that, end quote. In fact, Scripture applies that designation to Christ Himself in our book, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, when we're told that in His incarnation, Christ took the form of a slave. And as we submit ourselves to, to fully to His loving rule, not only do we honor Him as our Master, but we also follow Him in His example. And so my question to you is, is this your identity do you gladly accept this title, a slave of Christ? Are you completely submitted? Are you singularly devoted? Are you totally dependent? Paul and Timothy were, and in mentioning their slavery to Christ right off the bat, Paul intended that the Philippians, who had been struggling with issues of steadfastness amidst conflict, unity among believers, humility, and joy amidst persecution, he intended that they would be reminded that they too are slaves of Christ Jesus. And that reality of slavery is going to fuel steadfastness and opposition. It's going to fuel unity among the congregation because you're all slaves. Humility, because you understand yourself as one who is subject and subservient to somebody else. And joy, because your master is kind and loving and beneficent. And so 
we've seen the slaves of Christ. The second component of Paul's greeting to the Philippians speaks of the saints in Christ. The saints in Christ. Verse 1 again, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. So Paul calls the the believers in Philippi saints. Now, unfortunately, in our world, the word saints has been totally obscured and and muddied. Total uh, cloud of confusion surrounds the word because the Roman Catholic Church has co-opted this biblical term and applied it in a way that it's not at all what the Bible says. They use it to refer to a select group of spiritually elite people to be applied to them only after they've died and on the basis of their own merits in this life. And I don't know if you could get further away from the biblical designation, the biblical definition of the word saint. Rather than the spiritually elite, the title properly belongs to all believers. And rather than being bestowed after death, it's conferred at the moment of the new birth. And far from being based on the believer's own works, The the holiness, the saintliness of a believer is based entirely on the merit of Christ alone. The word means holy or set apart. Those who are called saints are are to be understood as those who have been set apart by God and set apart for God. In fact, God's people are called saints on the basis of the holiness of God. It was true as far back as the Levitical law, Leviticus 11, 44. The Lord proclaimed to Israel, For I am Yahweh your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And so even in the Old Testament, believers in Yahweh are called saints. Psalm 16, 3. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Psalm 34, 9, O fear Yahweh, you his saints. And just as Israel was set apart for God to be a people for his own possession, to serve him in truth, it's the same for the church. The New Testament everywhere applies the term saints to all believers in Jesus Christ, as they are all set apart by God to be a possession for himself. Just a few texts. Acts 9.32, Luke records that as Peter was traveling, he came down also to the saints who were at Lydda. Now, he didn't just go visit a select group of people who were at Lydda. He, this is a way of referring to everybody, all the believers there. Paul addresses his letters to the saints who were in Ephesus, the saints who were in Colossae. He wasn't writing to only a specific group of people in those cities. He was writing to the entire church there. And my goodness, Paul addressed both of his letters to the Corinthians to the saints in Corinth. Now, let me tell you, if Corinth, if the Corinthians could be called saints, folks, there's hope for all of us because the Corinthians had some major problems. I mean, there was sexual sexual immorality in that church that was not even named among the Gentiles. And inspired scripture calls them saints. And that's because all believers are saints. And your saintliness has nothing to do with your merits. Not at all. Look at the text. The Philippians were saints in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. The great expositor James Montgomery Boyce said this, The one who is a saint in the biblical sense will strive to be holy, but his holiness, however little or however great it may be, doesn't make him a saint. He is a saint because he has been set apart by God. Another commentator writes, The saint's holiness is inherent in their calling and position in Christ. It is not earned by social position or moral performance, but by union with Jesus Christ. So we are not holy based upon our own merits. We are hopelessly sinful and totally depraved. But Christ did, in fact, achieve righteousness, did, in fact, achieve holiness, was indeed set apart in his own actions. He did live the righteous life that God requires. And because we trust in him for our righteousness, we are set apart from the world. We are reckoned to be righteous, sanctified, consecrated to him for the service of the God of the universe by virtue of our union with him. We are saints in Christ Jesus. And this this doctrine of the believer's union with Christ is so important, so foundational to Paul. Books have been written on the phrase that Paul uses in Christ all the way throughout his letters, in Christ here, in Christ there. 
Even here in Philippians alone, he uses the phrase at least 21 times. So aside from being saints in Christ, believers find encouragement in Christ, chapter 2, verse 1. We rejoice in Christ, chapter 3, verse 1. We glory or boast in Christ, chapter 3, verse 3. We stand firm in the Lord, chapter 4, verse 1. And the peace of God guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Every blessing that you enjoy as a Christian, you enjoy on the basis of your union with Christ. You are saints. You have been consecrated, set apart by God in Christ Jesus. And so Paul writes to the saints who are in Christ Jesus and who are in Philippi. Now, we spent quite a bit of time last week talking about the, the background and the relationship between the Philippian congregation and Paul, so I won't rehash all of that this morning. But I do want to comment briefly on the strategic nature of Philippi itself, the city itself. What put Philippi on the map in the ancient world, aside from having hosted a strategic battle that kind of helped shift the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire, was its accessible location. If you remember your Mediterranean geography, you kind of know that Italy and Greece and uh, Asia Minor, they all kind of plunge down into the Mediterranean. Italy comes down like this. You go over to Greece, it comes down like this. You go over to Asia, Asia Minor, and it comes along this side here. And so anyone traveling long distances between these countries, if you wanted to get to central Italy, if you wanted to get to Achaia in Greece, you needed to go along the top and then come down. And so along the top, there was built what was called the Via Ignatia or the Ignatian Highway. And the Ignatian Highway ran straight through Philippi. So that and the presence of gold and silver mines located in nearby mountains made Philippi a major commercial center. People were traveling there all the time. It was a very strategic city in the Greco-Roman world as it hosted travelers from all over the empire. And so it was a very strategic city for the gospel a very strategic city in which to have a solid gospel presence for there to be slaves of Christ who were set apart to proclaim the gospel of Christ to the many people who would travel through that city. And it's not only that it's important because of its strategic setting, its strategic location, but it was also important because it was a colony of Rome. Luke says as much in, in Acts 16, 12, where he calls Philippi a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. The thing is, it wasn't just a colony. It, it, had, it enjoyed the highest privilege f that a Roman municipality could hold. It was called the Ius Italicum. This meant that it was, it was governed by Roman law, but it wasn't governed by Rome. So they had the, the privileges of Roman government while they could govern themselves. That exempted them from taxes from Rome, and it granted them the privileges, the full rights and privileges of Roman citizens. And the thing is, the Philippians gloried in this. They loved it. They spoke Latin, not, well, they spoke Greek too, but they spoke Latin as the, as the lingua franca. They copied Roman architecture, and they even patterned their, their dress off of Roman customs. They loved their Roman citizenship. They were Romans. You even see that in the, in the chapter in Acts 16, you know, these people coming in here, Jews telling us that we should be, observe these customs and it's not lawful for us to observe being Romans loyal to Caesar. So the Philippian Christians needed to battle that. They need to, to battle that mindset as they forsook their identity as the doulos of the Lord Caesar and became the douloi of the Lord Jesus Christ. They needed to be reminded that their citizenship in the kingdom of heaven superseded and outranked their citizenship, their coveted and gloried in citizenship of the Roman Empire. And in fact, Paul reminds them of just that in chapter 3, verse 20, where he says, contrary to the pagans who walk in the uninhibited indulgence of their flesh, our citizenship, verse 20, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for a savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will not destroy our bodies so that our sins in the body don't matter, but will transform our humble bodies into the state of the conformity with the body of His glory. And this issue of proper citizenship actually strikes right at the heart of the letter. I've mentioned a few times the thesis verse of Philippians is 1 verse 27, 
conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Well, that word that gets translated conduct yourselves is the Greek word polituomai. Polituomai sounds like politic or polis, the Greek word for city. And so what it was saying, what Paul was telling them here was to live as a citizen. That was the way you translated that verb, to live as a citizen. So at the very heart of this epistle, two Christians who were, who were very, very proud of their citizenship for, to Rome, Paul exhorts them to live as citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And one characteristic of a citizen living worthy of the gospel is the unity that he would exhort them to throughout the letter. And so even right here, in the opening, he makes it clear that he is writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were at Philippi. He uses the word all no less than five times in these short eight verses right at the beginning of the letter, explicitly addressing the congregation as a unit. Take a look at them really quickly with me. Aside from verse one, you have verse four, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. I pray for all of you and I rejoice with all of you. Verse 7, it is only right for me to feel this way about you all. End of verse 7, you all are partakers of grace with me. And verse 8, I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. There are no factions. Paul is not contributing to any sort of hierarchy in the congregation. He's right into them all. He loves them all. His affection abounds for them all because they're one because his affection is grounded not in some sort of subjective experience and, you know, character, personality matches, but because of the objective reality of their fellowship in the gospel through Christ. And so then on top of addressing all the saints, Paul adds, including the overseers and deacons. These are the, the two offices of church leadership, the overseers, the elders, who were responsible for the teaching and the governing of the church and to shepherd the flock by providing oversight and protection and supervision. And then the deacons, those servants who model spiritual, merciful service and to, who work alongside the elders in the implementation of their preaching, oversight, and teaching in the practical life of the church. But though Paul recognizes that, th they, that these are are leaders that are set apart to rule and to serve the church. He addresses them all here as a unit to all the saints who are in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. It's not to the saints and then also to the overseers and the deacons. No, it's the overseers and deacons part of the congregation. In Acts 20, verse 28, Paul talks to the Ephesian elders at Miletus before he leaves them, and he says, shepherd the flock of God, among whom the Lord has made you overseers. Among whom, not over whom. Among whom you have been made overseers. So there's that duality. There is a, a distinction in role and in function, but they're united in being and essence. There is no hierarchy. They're on equal footing, even though the roles are, are different. It's much like marriage. The complementarian view of marriage where the, the husband and the wife are one in Christ Jesus, co-heirs of, etern of eternal life together, neither, neither more essentially or ontologically greater in the presence of Christ, and yet there are differing roles where the, the husband is to exercise loving headship and the wife is to submit faithfully to her husband. Complementary roles united in essence. And so Paul addresses the letter to the congregation at Philippi but he's also careful to include the leadership, not only because he wants them to bear the responsibility of implementing the instructions that he's going to give them in this letter, but also to emphasize the unity among the congregation, the unity to which he will exhort them throughout. And so those are the saints. We've seen the slaves of Christ. We've seen the saints in Christ. And now let's turn to mind the truth packed into the salutation because of Christ. The salutation because of Christ. So Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this greeting is very familiar to us. It, it occurs in some form in all 13 of Paul's letters. But even though it's so common, it is anything but an empty cliche for Paul. 
what you have here is the very essence of Paul's theology condensed and packed into one succinct sentence. When he spoke of slaves and saints, he gave you the essence of the Christian life, slavery and sainthood set apart for God. And now when he speaks of grace and peace, he gives you the essence of the message that he preaches, grace and peace. First element of that greeting is grace. It is the Greek term charis, which is significant because of what it stands in place of. In a normal greeting that stands at the beginning of regular first century Greek letters, one expects to find the word kyrain. And kyrain is simply the word for greeting, greetings. It was their version of hello. But instead of this normal greeting, Paul employs wordplay and adapts the familiar kyrain to the distinctively Christian charis, the very theologically motivated charis. Sounds similar, very different in meaning. And this is another instance of Paul adapting the regular, everyday aspects of life to reflect the reality that has been transformed in Christ. One commentator says, here is a marvelous example of Paul's turning into gospel, everything that he sets his hand to. We spoke earlier of this radical, dramatic shift that took place in Paul's life and his thinking because of his encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road. He went from this rigorous Pharisee seeking to, to find a righteousness of his own that's derived from the law to counting all of his achievements garbage and seeking to pursue that righteousness in Christ alone. But the thing is, it's not only these lofty theological ideals that get transformed in Paul's life. His life is entirely reinterpreted in the light of Jesus Christ, right down to the way he says hello. Not Kyrain, but charis. Not greetings, but grace to you. And grace, of course, is that unmerited favor of God freely bestowed upon unworthy sinners as an overflow of God's abounding sufficiency in himself. And Paul reminds his, his readers right at the outset of his letter that everything that we are, we are by grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace is the foundation of the Christian experience. We earn nothing. We are so destitute in, our, in and of ourselves of moral goodness and, and moral sufficiency that in every way we relate to God, we, re, we accomplish nothing of ourselves. Everything must be provided for us as an undeserved gift. That's, that's a, a humble place to be. I don't know if you've thought of grace that way, but grace is offensive to people who want to earn their righteousness. Nothing will be provided by you. Everything will be provided for you. Amazing that that can offend some people because it's such a gift. But everything will be provided for you. Oh, no, no, no. I want to do something. Won't have it. The, the Christian life is founded upon, from start to finish, grace. And James Boyce, I love this. He gets this right on the money. Listen to this. It's a little bit of an extended quote, but listen to him. It was by grace that the worlds were hung in space and the earth was disposed for human life. It was by grace that the mountains were created and the world was filled with life. By grace, humans are made in God's image with every capacity for fellowship with Him. By grace, humans receive the biblical revelation after the fall. By grace, God chose Israel for a special purpose in history. It was grace that sent the Lord Jesus to live a life that revealed the Father and to die for human sin. Grace leads us to trust in Christ. Grace sent the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. Grace has preserved the church through the centuries. Grace will bring forth the final resurrection, and grace will sustain us throughout eternity as we live in unbroken fellowship with God and grow in the knowledge of Him. Amazing grace. Paul says it in, in verse 6 of chapter 1, it was God who began a good work, the good work of salvation in the Philippians. And it will be God who brings that work of grace to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Elsewhere, Paul said, faithful is he who calls you and he will bring it to pass. God starts, God finishes. And on the in-between, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
Beginning, middle, and end, the Christian life is a story of God's magnificent grace. And not just grace, peace. The Greek word irene, which is where we get the English word irenic or the name irene, it translates the Hebrew term shalom, which is, has just a mountain of significance wrapped up in that tiny little word shalom. Peace, well-being, salvation, deliverance, wholeness, tranquility. Anybody not want those things? <laughs> What a, what a mountain of, of meaning wrapped up in that tiny little word. Moises Silva, commentator, commentator on Philippians, writes, changing Kyrene to Charis calls attention to the very essence of the Christian message, and adding a reine reminds them of the rich themes of the spiritual welfare evoked by the Hebrew shalom. Everybody in this world searches for peace, every single person. So many people that I've had spiritual conversations with preach the gospel to, They've spoken about their desire for peace, for a spiritual calm, for an emotional and mental respite, relief from the turmoil that they experience day to day as they participate in this obviously broken world. They know, even the unbelievers know that something has gone wrong, horribly wrong with this world. And they sense that corruption that has infected themselves. They sense it even with inside themselves in the lack of peace. They've experienced broken relationships. They've experienced strained marriages. They've experienced bitterness and gossip and slander and the unrest that those things always bring with them. And now they want something. They want anything that will soothe them, that will give them relief. And they are willing to try anything. Tony Robbins, yoga, Joel Osteen, money, Success, prestige, making a difference in someone's life. People search everywhere for peace. But our passage tells us precisely where it is. In Christ Jesus. It is in Christ. The word order of Paul's opening greeting is significant. Grace to you and peace. Peace is the result of God's grace. No one who remains an enemy of God, hostile to God, as Romans 8, 7 says, no one who refuses to bow the knee in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ can know anything of peace. None. Peace is only a result of the grace that comes. Where? Verse 2, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God himself is the source of our peace through the atoning work of Christ. So through faith in the death and the resurrection of Christ, our sin, which provokes God to holy wrath, is paid for. And so peace with God, along with peace with each other, is Christ's to freely give. In John 14, 27, Jesus is preparing his disciples for a life to be lived without him physically present. And he says to them, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, repeats it. Not as the world gives do I give to you. No, not as the world gives. Not a brief moment of so-called peace that promises hope but quickly fades away. An eternal peace that abides with us forever through the abiding ministry of the Holy Spirit who is in us. Ephesians 2.14 says that Christ himself is our peace. Philippians 4, 9 calls God the God of peace who will be with you always. And of course, we cannot forget, we've quoted a couple times already in this sermon and a couple times last sermon. I suppose it won't be the last time that I repeat this verse in sermons in Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 7. The peace of God, that is, the peace which comes from God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Every divine blessing is wrapped up in Him. My question to you this morning is, do you have Him? Do you love Him? Do you trust in Him for your righteousness, for your acceptance before God? Are you submitted to Him as His slave? Are you set apart by God, called as a saint unto Christ Jesus? Do you know the bounty, the bounty of God's grace? Do you know the sobriety and the solemnity, the tranquility of his peace? 
You could sit through every single sermon I preach on Philippians, every sermon Lance preaches, every sermon Phil preaches, even every sermon that Pastor John preaches, and none of it will be profitable to you if you are a stranger to God's grace and peace. Writer Hebrews tells us of the Israelites in the wilderness that the word preached to them was of no profit because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So turn from your sin if you are outside of Christ this morning, if you do not know his grace, if you do not know his peace. Turn from your sin. Submit all of your thinking and all of your behavior to the lordship of Jesus Christ and trust in him for the perfect provision of righteousness, of holiness that is necessary to enjoy the eternal fellowship that God has designed for you to enjoy with him. And for my dear brothers and sisters who know him, remember that you are slaves of Christ Jesus. Remember that you are saints in Christ Jesus, set apart for holiness and service to your master. And as you go from this place, may grace and peace be with you. Let's pray. Father, we love your word. Oh, how we love it. The richness of just a greeting. We thank you for the, the Apostle Paul and the way that his life was so submitted to you and to the Holy Spirit that filled his heart with these wonderful truths. Even in these short verses, in the most normal of everyday occurrences, his hello is full of grace and peace. May our lives be transformed from the big way down to the minuscule by the reality that we've experienced, maybe not on a Damascus road, maybe not being struck down and blinded by heavenly light, but blinded by the spiritual light that paradoxically opens our eyes from our blindness created by sin to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We thank you for that moment. We pray that that gospel, that salvation would be sufficient motivation in our lives to live lives as slaves, as willing, happy, devoted, faithful slaves, slaves who have been set apart, made holy by our connection, our union with our Savior, and that we might be instruments of grace and peace in the lives of all those with whom we come in contact, both believers and to the unsaved world, hoping to be a part of calling in your sheep into your fold as you receive the glory and the honor that comes from their worship which you deserve. Oh, Father, get what you are worthy of in your church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. For more information about the ministry of the Grace Life Pulpit, visit at www.thegracelifepulpit.com. Copyright by the Grace Life Pulpit, all rights reserved.